Hello everyone, my name is Annie Reyes and for this summer, Dr. Casey Hewitt and I will be your moderators. We're pleased that you could all join us for this week lecture in our first seven week Known Your Anatomy mini series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different your anatomy topics each week. This series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free high quality didactic opportunities. We would like to recognize our Known Your Anatomy planning group for their hard work pulling this mini series off. We would also like to thank our sponsors for their financial support for these series. Before we start, there are disclaimers for the series. This training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left of your screen and a recording of today's lecture will be provided on our website later this week. Questions will be asked at the end and not during the lecture. Today's Q&A is led by Dr. Casey Hewitt. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Price for today's lecture titled Frontal Lobes, Anatomy and Function. Dr. Price is an associate professor in the Department of Clinical and Health Psychology with a joint appointment in the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Florida in Gainesville. She's a licensed psychologist with Bohr's specialty in clinical neuropsychology. She's a director of the Perioperative Cognitive Anesthesia Network Program for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Her primary research aims are to understand the relative contribution of white matter versus subcortical gray matter, structure integrity on the cognitive profiles of subcortical neurogenerative diseases. Second, her aim is to apply this knowledge towards more collaborative and longitudinal research examining the predictive value of cognitive profiles, why and great matter structure integrity on one to this disease associated cognitive decline as well as vulnerability to accelerated cognitive change after elective medical interventions such as um, major elective surgery. And it's a pleasure to have Dr. Price giving us a lecture on executive functions. Thank you, Dr. Price. Great. Thank you so very much for this wonderful introduction and for the invitation. I'm really honored. I've heard so many wonderful things. I haven't been able to watch this on my own. So I am so glad to be able to be a part of it. And now you have a fan. I'll be watching all the time. So, all right. So I'm going to do is I'm going to share my slides here. Okay. Can you see the screen okay? Do you just see the major screen? You don't yes. see the... Yeah, it looks perfect, thank you. It looks fine, okay, good. All right, so what I'm gonna talk about today, we're gonna to talk about executive function. Um, and we typically talk about executive function, we think about the frontal lobe. So one thing you're going to learn is that executive function is not just the frontal lobes. But one thing we are going to ask is, um, I'm going to ask that you at least know the regions of the frontal lobe, because this is going to help you when you are trying to understand uh, executive function and as you're assessing individuals who may have executive dysfunction. So here we go. Today's discussion, I'm going to orient you to some anatomy. We're going to talk about the basic roles associated with the frontal lobe, and then we're going to try a couple of cases for an that lesion for clinical evaluation. Okay, so... First, let's talk about anatomical boundaries. I'm going to talk to you about the prefrontal cortex, the three major functional areas, and we're going to talk about basal ganglia connections. That's the first part. All right, so first off here. Now, we have to remember the lateral and the medial side of the brain. So we're thinking about um, the cortex area here. And here are the main areas I want you to remember. You have your motor strip, your premotor area, and then you have your prefrontal cortex here. So this is the lateral side, but then there's also a medial side to the frontal lobe that many of us forget. And so I'm glad that we're here to have a remem uh, to remember that in practice. So you have your motor area, the premotor, because you have to remember the cortex folds in, and then you have the medial with your anterior cingulate. And then you have your orbital frontal region. So this whole area here, hopefully you can see my mouse, is the prefrontal cortex. So now I'm gonna give you some quiz, a quiz, um, what is this area here that we talked about? So hopefully you're remembering that this is part of the premotor region, okay? And this region is related to responding to stimuli, um, uh, per, 
uh, random stimuli, for example, this region can be partially involved in eye movement, particularly through electrical impulses. And the premotor region here is really important for preparing information from your primary motor cortex and other functions of the brain. It's going to send signals to different areas of your body. All right. And it's divided into different parts. You have your dorsal, you have a, a ventral part of your premotor cortex. You don't need to know all of that. I just want to make sure that you know that this area is there. It's a very essential part of your, your motor function in your frontal lobe. And so we're going to come back to that in a little bit. Okay, so premotor cortex. Now, the next one, pretty large. We talked about the we talked about this area a, uh, a minute ago. Do you remember what the name of this area is? Okay, well, this is the prefrontal cortex. All right, and in the prefrontal cortex, you, this is a very complicated area, multiple regions um, here. As you can see in this next image, this shows you it's a little bit blurry, but this is actually not in a human brain. You can see here, this is in a, a monkey brain, and there are different areas here that are cytoarchitecturally cyto distinct based on cellular layers, as well as different functional regions that you'll know from Brodman, uh, Brodman's area. So you're gonna know the prefrontal cortex is complicated because it actually includes multiple regions. You have your orbital frontal region, and that orbital frontal region is here. You can see right here, it's, this is from the side, this is from your ventral view, and this is from your mesial view. All right, um, so you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to this region. We're gonna talk about this region as well. It's part of the prefrontal cortex. That's the orbitofrontal specific area of the prefrontal cortex. And then here's another area of the prefrontal cortex you need to remember. Um, and what area would this be? So I want you to think about that, particularly if you're a student or a trainee uh, to remember what structure this could be. Because remember we talked about, you have the, the cingulate cortex, you've got, this is all of your mesial area. So this would be your medial prefrontal cortex in the middle of the brain, slicing right in the half and you're looking on either side, okay? And the inside of the hemisphere. So um, this is where the cortex is folding in. You might've remembered from when you studied the homunculus from your sensory and the motor system, you can tell a lot. You have to think about the homunculus running across, right, right through, um, um, uh, providing you with your boundaries of what areas and what type of the body is being stimulated within different areas. Uh, we're gonna talk about that in a second. Later on in the, in the talk, I'm gonna show you a slide that actually will give you some nice lesion detection. Okay, so what about um, this last area? This is really fascinating for one reason, well, multiple reasons, but let me back up. These regions here, the orbital frontal, have very cytoarchitecturally cellular dis distinctly uh, unique. There are different areas here, the um, area of Broadman 10 and 11 that are associated here um, that I want you to remember um, overlap with a lot of key sensories, your orbital frontal, et cetera. Um, and then here, when we get back to the dorsal lateral prefrontal region, this has a number of different areas here that are not primarily based on your cytoarchitectural or cellular layers. This is your dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And even though it has this nice blue blob on top here, right, this, lay, this area of the cortex is functionally defined, whereas the other two are defined by cellular layers. And you can actually see distinctly distinct differences in the cortex, in the frontal cortex associated with those regions of interest. But for the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is this structure here, it's functionally defined, which makes it really unique. It's actually very interesting and challenging to study the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex because it's, it's individualized based on that, on that person. So uh, it's been identified with functional resting state or functional studies task-based oriented studies. And you'll see that the dorsal lateral prefrontal uh, cortex is actually different for everybody. Um, other things that are interesting is that is really challenging um, to uh, do a, to seg segment that area using different types of software. If you've ever tried to use FreeSurfer versus other tools, you'll see that it'll actually extract different areas and different sizes of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, so there's lots of challenges and interesting elements within 
these uh, different regions of the brain, and you can see how complex the prefrontal regions are. All right, so those are that's just the basic, very basic elements of some of the key regions as neuropsychologists we assess within the frontal lobe, okay? Now, I'm gonna come back to those regions, but I also want you to realize that those structures, those cortical structures are connected to important subcortical structures and also specific white matter circuits, all right? And this is, you're gonna understand this in a minute. So hopefully this is a bit of a review, all right. So there are five components of the basal ganglia, as well as the thalamus that you need to remember when you're thinking of the frontal lobes, all right? And the reason why is because the frontal lobe is connected to these structures, these five components, all right? You've got the caudate nuclei, the butamen, the globus pallidus, the sub subthalamic nucleus, and the substantia nigra, okay? Now the caudate and putamen combine to make the striatum, the putamen and the globus pallidus form the lenticular, lentiform nucleus, which looks just like a lens. And then the caudate, the putamen, and the globus pallidus make the corpus striatum. So here's a nice uh, depiction of this. Um, and you have to think about more of a vertical, you have to think about the vertical aspect of the brain, right? And the connections between each of these regions. Here is another depiction of this relative to the frontal lobe, I like to say here, this is your coronal slice, like you're taking a slice here and you're looking in. This slice you're looking, this is axial slice, so you're taking a slice here and you're looking down. All right, so here now you can see that you have your uh, caudate nucleus in the putamen here, forming your striatum, all right? These two areas here. Then you have your, the ventral lateral uh, nucleus of the thalamus here. And you have your subthalamic nucleus, your globus pallidus, and substantia nigra. Now, key among here, you have your um, you have GABA, GABA, you have glutamine, you have major neurotransmitters, but you also have quite a bit of in, um, impact from your dopamine, acetylcholine, and your serotonergic uh, neurotransmitters. And what's happening is that these are providing an input um, and a pathway for activation within the frontal lobe and vice versa. And they're going through these white matter fibers here. So you can see this connection going from, the, from these structures, these gray matter structures, these nuclei, the cells here, all the way to the external areas of the cortex through these white matter fibers that are crossing one another, right? Sending information back and forth. So we have to appreciate this loop. And through work of Alexander um, DeLong and Strick, which you can read and you know this very well of where you are in memory, um, all of their wonderful circuits that were um, published uh, approximately, what now, 50 years ago? That's really sad. Um, and so there's been so much work since then, but what we still know based on this classic work is that there are three neuroanatomical loops and two motor. Okay, and you can, there are, there's been debate as to whether there are other ones, but the one I really want you to remember if you are going to be a neuropsychologist involved in neuropsychology, involved in neurology, you have to remember there are three neurobehavioral circuits, all right? And the basic pathway is the same. This is really important because what, what happens behaviorally is that you can have a lesion in the cortical area, for example, Robin area 10 and 11, and you could present with a certain pattern, but if you have that lesion in the striatum, you could show the same pattern. You could have a lesion here, you might show the same pattern. So you have to see there's duplication among this, among this loop, okay? So I'm just checking the chat to make sure, okay, that I'm not missing something. Okay, so for the orbitofrontal cortex, we're gonna start from in a hierarchy, we're gonna start at the, we're gonna start with the orbitofrontal region. All right, and you have to think of, there's connection for everybody. Let me back up, let me back up one slide. I want you to remember there's a connection from the cortical to the striatum, to the pallidum, to the thalamic regions, and all right, going back. Sorry, that arrow should be the other way. But um, one thing that differentiates the different regions of the brain is where in the striatum the cortex is connecting. Okay, so pay attention to that. So if you look here at the orbitofrontal cortex, it goes from the cortical basal um, 
uh, broadened areas 10 and 11 to the striatum, it's going to the lateral ventral medial caudate. And when you start to see ventral regions, you start to realize, okay, ventral is actually, this is really interesting, ventral is getting information that is relaying information more about uh, limbic responses, the vagus nerve is there, pain responses are in the caudate, okay, uh, in that area. Um, and then also ventral striatum. So if we think about orbital frontal, what you're going to learn about the orbital frontal is that the orbital frontal region is involved in your uh, a lot of your limbic responses. So this makes sense that it's going to the cortical to the striatal, then going to the palatal with the globus pallidus internal and substantia nigra pars um, and then the thalamus. Okay, and then back. So, uh oh. If we, I have to take this off. So if you think about this, what happens is when this is involved in our personality, our mood, and then you're gonna hear a term called utilization behavior that I'm gonna show you. Um, so this is just showing you how this, this loop is involved in different types of uh, frontal functions, typically what we associate with personality, okay. So that's just a little taste of what we're gonna talk about. Now, the next area that I want you to think about, because remember, we're focusing on the prefrontal cortex, all right? So the next area I want you to think of is the mesior, the medial region of the frontal lobe where I showed you earlier, okay? So this area, we're still in the premotor area, but this is now mesial, and now it's connecting to the ventral portion of the striatum again, but you also have involvement um, with the putamen and you have the nucleus accumbens, um, and then it's going to the pallidum, and then it's going to the th thalamus. So here, what you often see here is you see a disruption in motivation, you see a disruption in attention, you can see some apathy, you can see slowness. And I'm going to show you a little bit more. We're going to talk about this more. This is just a taste of what we're going to talk about. Then the next one, the next area, remember how I talked about this was a functional area in the frontal lobe. This is the dorsolateral region of the, the cortex of the frontal lobe. This one, you again have, you have this area, classically we consider area 46 involved, and it goes to the dorsolateral caudate head. Now remember, I showed you earlier how the orbital frontal circuit and the mesial went to the ventral striatum. This one's going to the dorsal area of, I'm sorry, dorsal area of the striatum, and specifically the dorsal portion of the caudate. And what we've learned through research is that the caudate is also segmented in numerous different areas and where the um, projection systems are coming in can tell us a lot. So what we know is that the caudate, the dorsal portion of the caudate actually is really important in more of the cognitive aspects of function, whereas the ventral, like I said, is more involved in more of the visceral, pain, fatigue, um, nausea, uh, those aspects. So you wanna think about where the input and the output systems are within the structures. Okay, hold on one second, let me take this one away too. All right, so now we're back. So typically when we think about damage to the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, we're thinking about that's the area involved in executive dysfunctions, what we typically call um, um, damage to this area. But I want you to think a little bit more critically about this. And I want you to think about really what is executive dysfunction. Is executive dysfunction really aligned only to the dorsal lateral prefrontal region. So we're gonna talk about that too in a few minutes. Reason why it's typically associated with executive dysfunction um, is because individuals who have damage to the dorsal lateral region, typically those are individuals who are having difficulty um, searching for different types of information. They might have uh, make source memory errors. They have difficulty with working memory. Um, maintaining um, clear output. So you're gonna see some hyperkinetic behaviors I'm gonna give you some examples of. They may be more stimulus bound. Um, and it's just like things jump out and they wanna grab them. So I'm gonna show you a bit of, of that too. All right, so the next slide. Now, so that was just basic, basic, basic anatomy with regard to frontal lobe um, areas and their connections to the basal ganglia and the circuits or the three parallel circuits. And the one thing I do want you to remember though, the takeaway message from that is that those cortical regions are connecting to specific areas and specific um, structures within that basal ganglia network and within specific areas of the thalamus. 
and that there's a, that lovely, beautiful parallel circuit, and that you can have a lesion in any area of those circuits that can produce a very similar behavior, all right? So we may think that a behavior is cortical, but what actually might turn out that it's a lesion within the thalamus, all right? In a specific area of the thalamus. Some wonderful work by Bruce Crossan, who was at Emory, he was at UF too. He showed that with language over and over. So if you need to, if you're interested in that, I encourage you to read some of his books and some of his work specifically about um, the subcortical uh, structures and language. It was, it's a really great, great textbook um, and a lot of his research. So now let's talk about the functional roles, okay, of the frontal lobe. I'm gonna talk about the framework, its role in motor output, and we're gonna just talk about basic definitions, and then I'm gonna go back over again the functions of those prefrontal regions and what happens if you have a damage, okay? And then we're gonna try two clinical cases. Oops, oops. Let me back up. I hit the end button when I didn't mean to hit the end button. So here we are. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. This slide is one of my favorites. This is about frontal lobe and this, this conceptual framework. Now I want you to, we're gonna change the word function from frontal lobe function. I want you to think of the frontal lobe as a mediator. All right, and what does mediator mean? Mediator is a person who's in between two types of opposing forces and trying to help create something or some agreement between two types of forces is basically what the frontal lobe is doing, all right? It's a mediator. So look at this figure. This is a lovely figure. Um, and this shows you, let's take from the, from the bottom. This is your environment. The frontal lobe is the mediator between the environment and the rest of the body, basically, okay? And it's in, you have to remember that half your brain is sensory. The other half is motor. Your, this, then your frontal lobe is your biggest lobe right? It really is huge. So what's happening here is you have to, humans, which is actually really interesting, humans um, have one of the largest um, frontal lobes, okay? Um, and what do we do? What is one of the biggest things that we do, humans? We create. We are um, known for creating. We have created uh, buildings, right? Everything you have, we created. We created tools, right? So, and we have thumbs. So we've actually, we have used things to change our entire world. And I'm able to talk to you wherever you are through the power of Zoom, right? And that was created by humans. And that's because we take the environment and we change it, right? So that's exactly what the frontal lobes have allowed us to do. So we have the environment, information comes in to our primary sensory areas, within our Heschel's gyrus, think about it, our occipital regions, our sensory tactile. Our frontal lobes take that primary information and they, it goes from primary sensory, whatever that area is here, goes to our unimodal association cortex to figure out what it is, right? Then it goes to, okay, now let's figure out um, multiple information about that object. Then our prefrontal lobe takes that information and knows what to do with it. And then we make a decision somehow that we're gonna use this object in some certain way or we hear something and so we're gonna respond this way. And then we create from that standpoint, we make a rule that, oh, now I wanna do X or now we wanna do Y. And so then we produce it. So that's what the frontal lobes have done. They take the information, the sensory in, and they create it and we produce. All right. So now you have to consider it that as a mediator. So there's no direct syntactic input, right, or output from the external environment. It comes through the sensory and it comes through the limbic system or emotions also. And then we produce an output and that's the motor behavior. And it's linked exclusively through the cortex and subcortical regions. So it is really is a mediator, okay? Um, and it's a dispersed neural network such that you have to think about the fact that um, 
it's uh, not only just the frontal to the subcortical structures that I showed you, but the frontal to the parietal regions, all right? And I didn't even show you those networks, but you can see it here, the pictures. You have your longitudinal fasciculi that are going back and forth between your frontal and parietal. And you know now that working memory is frontal and parietal, right? So we no longer really think of it just as a frontal lobe. So as you go through, you have to apply the frontal lobe function then to cognition behavior. And you have to remember that your higher order thinking, right, is fused to this whole entire biological drive of what you see in the environment, right? So when you think about how a person is um, engaging on the environment, if they're able to, you have to, I'm trying to think of the best way to tell you, um, it's not, it's your responsiveness to the environment, how well you, how a person is experiencing the environment and then their ability to take that information and create something from the environment and change their output or respond appropriately. So it fuses, higher order thinking fuses the biological drive with an external behavior, okay? All right. And then you have to think that the frontal lobe is also helping to regulate that behavior. What is it appropriate? Is it not to change the environment in a certain way? So there's always this give and take, all right, between your, what you see, your internal drives and what you produce. Um, and so the result is a really nicely, you know, hopefully a goal-directed behavior where a person is able to balance those effective things that are coming through not only the orbitofrontal region, sorry. Someone say something? No, nope. something it's coming, information's coming through all the different areas of, um, of the brain, but then there's also the orbitofrontal region. You have to think about the mesial region. You're gonna see this a little bit more as we talk about it. And then there's the planning component. So all different areas of the prefrontal lobes are engaged together is with the whole brain. I hope this is making sense. Okay, so in general, the main message here is that the executive function is a function rather than a brain region. So don't think when you're doing your assessments or you're working with individuals that if there is executive dysfunction, that it's primarily in the frontal lobes where the lesion's located, okay? The frontal lobe is, a contrib is contributing, but it's part of a wider network of brain involvement, okay? So now we're gonna go back and we're gonna use this I want you to look at this picture over here to the left. We have the, the figure. And I want you to think about the regions that we talked about from this, from the, um, when we talked about the anatomical pathways to help you understand the behaviors that you see with individuals or with behaviors typically associated with the prefrontal cortex and specifically the orbital frontal pre, or pre, um, prefrontal cortex. So here, when we think about the orbital prefrontal cortex, what we found through different um, stimulation uh, studies, through lesion studies, through animal studies, um, case studies, we found that individuals, when there is a damaged or, or we found that the orbital frontal cortex is really important for uh, understanding and being able to engage on the environment uh, with regard to their internal drives and being able being able to uh, use your internal information and your internal drives to enact on the entire, on the external environment. So there's planning with regard to your intrinsic factors. There's also a reward and emotional value of stimuli, which is highly connected to your amygdala and the connections between the orbital frontal cortex to the amygdala. Uh, the orbital frontal cortex is really important for your ability to um, moderate your drives and appetites. It's involved in social behavior. And it, we really think of it with regard to our personality. And you probably remember some very famous cases about individuals who might've had a, a lesion to an area of the orbital frontal cortex um, and ha have had drastic changes in personality. And I bet you can name one off the top of your head, which would be Phineas Gage. And so you could think of that. Uh, that individual. And if you do, then you might remember that when you have damage to the orbital frontal cortex, that's when you start to see some of these behaviors. So 
clinically, you're going to look for these behaviors here. First, you might look for reduced decision-making ability or being overly impulsive, okay? Um, you might see poor social skills. So uh, Witzelstunts, which is an inappropriate jocularity or laughing, right? Um, maybe euphoria, inappropriate sexual advances, poor impulse control, poor sense of self. You might see some uh, disinhibition, acting impulsively, grabbing things. There's been some classic stories of individuals putting out glasses and people, uh, the patient or the individual who's being assessed might pick up the glasses. And even though that individual has their own pair of glasses on, they put their the other glasses that are on the table right on top of their own glasses. Um, uh, all different types of observations. I'm gonna give you an example in a minute. Then you might see uh, emotional ability. You might see that sometimes they're happy, sometimes they're sad, uh, aggressiveness, reduced self-awareness. So that's typically what we associate with personality changes. Now, how would you assess orbitofrontal function? What do you do? Um, and that's a really good question. And I wish I could have it as a group discussion, but in general, you know, there's some wonderful papers out there. And one I would love you to look at um, is, a, is a, some, there are some classic papers um, from Lermy that were published on case observations. And actually, observation is probably the best thing you could do as a clinician for observing and understanding orbitofrontal behavior. So you're watching an individual. You're a behaviorist, okay? So in um, Lermy's papers, this is one, and this is called utilization behavior. And so he has some wonderful papers where he had three different cases that who had uh, different areas of brain damage. And he does a lovely review of all the areas of the brain that were damaged in the separate papers. But in one paper, he summarizes the patients um, that he saw. And it wouldn't be IRB approved today, but actually what he did is he put out different situations. He brought in um, this wonderful woman here and he set up different stations for her. So for example, he took her into the kitchen and there were dishes there uh, that were dirty in the sink. And he just let her be and watched her. And she went over there, proceeded to go ahead and clean the dishes and put the dishes away, right? Um, and another example, he had brought her into, I think, um, into the bedroom and there had been uh, some needles out there or a sewing kit and she had gone ahead and she had begun to, she just picked it up and started sewing and fixing. And another more drastic approach, she actually had a syringe out and uh, she told him, she uh, filled up the syringe with the fluid there and said, told him that she would give him the shot. So that was a very clear one. Uh, very interesting case reports. Yeah, he has an, two other cases that he talks about, but it's, these are very extreme cases of utilization behavior, but they did have uh, damage within the orbital frontal regions of the brain, as well as the dorsal. Um, so observation is clearly one way in which you can assess orbital frontal function. Other ones is you can use tools such as the Iowa gambling task, where you can really pull on that uh, internal drive response. You can see how a person responds uh, to external stimuli based on it. Can they actually make a decision that is going to be useful for them? How, with regard to, do they change their environment and their cues? So I would suggest that you look at the Iowa gambling task or other um, tools if you want to assess orbital frontal beha behavior, but also the best uh, approach is using your own observation skills. Okay, so what about the medial frontal or the, sing or the singular region? All right, so this structure is involved, like we said again, in your initiation and your um, action and your emotional expression, okay? So here, when we think about this structure, um, this is an area of the brain where you're getting, you have, this is where, you know, back here, when we're talking about the orbital frontal regions, there is a reduced capacity to use internal stimuli to guide behavior based on an external stimulus, okay? Here, when we're talking about the medial or mesial region, this is when there's a lack of internal drive, all right? 
And this is more of an endogenous versus an exogenous. When we say endogenous, it means internally driven. Exogenous is more externally. So um, this is the ability to initiate and sustain your interest or your movement, all right? Cl very clear connections to the basal ganglia structure. Um, and we often see in this structure truly engaged in a number of different disorders. And I'm sure you can think of some on your own that might have, that you can classically think of would be associated with disruption to this structure here or the whole pathway. So these individuals would not engage as much on their environment. You could put out eyeglasses for them. They wouldn't pick them up, all right? You could try to get them to engage, um, to move to a certain area of the room. They're not interested. Even watching television, they may not be interested. Or maybe they sit and watch television all day and they don't do anything. So individuals with this structure, they typically are damaged to the structure or anywhere along that circuit that I mentioned before. They might show uh, signs of akinesia, which means A is loss, right? When you have the A preface, uh, loss of movement, all right? Or loss of in, in ability for movement of speech, of um, any physical movement at all. Uh, they may have abulia, apathy, uh, limited action, so limited emotional expression, limited social activity, and one of the classic, uh, classic diseases that we typically associate with medial frontal involvement or disruption in that in circuit here, this circuit here, we typically think of would be Parkinson's disease if you haven't thought of it yet, okay. Some measures that you could use to assess medial frontal functions, you know, you can look at apathy measurements, which is different from depression, you could use different scales. You could use your behavioral observations and also caregiver reports, uh, reduced initiation for goal-directed behavior, impaired activities of daily living, just not cleaning, taking care of themselves. You can see this type of behavior in individuals who are markedly depressed, okay? All right, so now let's contrast those two regions to the dorsolateral prefrontal region. All right, so the dorsolateral prefrontal region as we know, is a very large region, okay? We talked about the different areas of the dorsolateral prefrontal region. Um, and this area is involved in the planning component. Um, being able to use external information as well as combining internal to navigate and manipulate the environment. Now, this is where you are processing information online actively. So working memory is involved. Spatial, maintaining information in your mind, multiple types of information mind, whether it be spatial, verbal, uh, internal modulation, as well as external modulation. Engagement of both the internal and external uh, drives that are there. So this is very, um, very complex, possibly why it has such a very large area that we think of in the prefrontal cortex. It also, like I, says, I said, has connections to the subcortical structures, but also to the parietal regions, very much involved in your sensory awareness and your awareness of your whole uh, space, okay? Um, we typically think of it with regard to working memory. So we think about um, an individual, you know, doing two things at the same time. We think about disinhibition or being able to inhibit immediate responses. We think about attentional control. And here are some examples. So for example, if I ask somebody, I want you to draw a two, a three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three. And I kept pushing that person, right? And here's their output a two, a three, a two, a three, and they keep going, but then they lose set. They begin to lose their focus, lose their attention. They may get distracted due to internal or external reasons. And here you see a perseveration here, okay? So this is an example. It's actually a, Alex, it's a, a test um, based off uh, Alexander Luria, 
um, some of his work. And so that is an example of a loss of set that would be associated with dorsal outer prefrontal disruption. Another one is you've probably seen is the Stroop effect. So for example, where you have to see different colors and you name the colors and then you read the word, but then you have to name the color ink and not read the word. So you're having to inhibit, all right? And so this is the Stroop effect. This has been linked to also the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, all right, and the circuitry area. Another example, and we did, remember I talked to you about being able to, uh, the ability to be able to stop behaviors, um, uh, recognize when there is any type of modulation or disruption in a person's output, and being able to modulate their own output, that would be linked to dorsal lateral prefrontal region disruption. And here's some examples. This is also from um, Luria. This is called hyperkinetic behavior. You can see this here. These are some examples from his books. Um, so here's repeating the circles. You can see perseverations here. This is hyperkinetic um, behavior. And you'll see this on different types of drawings that you might be doing with your participant or your patients. Other areas associated or disruptions associated with dorsolateral prefrontal cortex would be planning and organization. One of my favorite tests is a clock drawing test. And here you can see that th this is a test where you would say, you, know, you have them do a command and a copy condition. And the instructions are, I want you to draw the face of the clock, put in all the numbers and set the hands to 10 after 11. So if I'd had this, uh, you probably would have seen, if I had had this in real time, you would have seen the person probably draw a clock, a circle, sorry, circle. Um, they may have put in the numbers, but here you can see the numbers are a bit disorganized, just a bit. <laughs> um, over here is where they have the 12 and the 11, 10, and then the one is on top of the two. And then you can see that there was some difficulty with the place in the hands and they're connecting the, the hands with a line going across with the different numbers. So the planning and organization is not there, at least from the command and, and the um, production of that clock themselves without an external stimulus. You give them in an external stimulus, like a copy, you can see that they improve. They still have some errors, but they did improve. So there was a response to an external stimulus. So this is internally driven and this is externally driven. Then you can see that there is still a little bit of an error here with the external driven. And this individual actually did have a, um, a type of disorder involving the region of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. But providing a, a comparison between internally driven and externally um, uh, uh, mediated uh, or external um, stimulus for modeling, can give you a really nice insight as to whether or not, as to the type of behavior a person is, or a type of um, impairment a person might have and where in the brain it can be. All right, so individuals who have dorsolateral frontal damage, they, you might see perseveration, you might see reduced word fluency, loss of output, you might see difficulties with working memory, like we mentioned, disinhibition, you see hyperkinetic behavior or poor planning. So there are a number of things that you could see with dorsal lateral um, regions uh, damage. All right, so clinical presentations. I'm just gonna give you a couple of um, examples in a minute. But first, let me just remind you, you know, that the human, uh, in humans, the prefrontal cortex occupies about 35% of the neocortex, just like I had told you before, it's, it's huge for us, right? Um, but it is the newest area of the cortex and it's the latest to grow. Uh, last to grow, first to be lost. Um, and, you know, we have to remember that it's one of the, it's still growing through your teen years. And so these are things to consider. Um, and it's different with regard to other animals. So it's our largest lobe. And it's, like I said, a mediator. Now, when we think about damage to those disorders, not only do we have to think about the age of the individual, et cetera, but we have to think about, all right, um, what areas and what structures are involved? Is it the cortex? Could it be the subcortical? Could it be neurotransmitter based only? Could it be white matter structures, et cetera? And so there are a number of cases, number of disorders uh, that you might see difficulties with the frontal lobes, frontotemporal dementia, 
Uh, you can see traumatic brain injury, frontal lobe epilepsy, attention deficit disorder, schizophrenia, Parkinson's disease. You can see stroke. And this is, a, this is from the Blumenfeld text of neuroanatomy through clinical cases. And I'm sure you remember the anterior cerebral artery, the middle and the posterior cerebral artery have different um, regions that they occupy and provide perfusion to. So you could have a damage to these and it could just uh, differentially disrupt the frontal lobes from here. So you have to think that the frontal lobes uh, really are quite wonderful. They provide us with an incredible um, um, uh, source of behavior, but really complex for us. Um, let me give you a couple of examples here. So this is uh, an individual who's 64 years old. He was referred for a neuropsychological evaluation by his neurologist. So his presenting symptoms included increased use of pornography, increased spending of money, multiple affairs, no longer working due to difficulties. He was brought in for a neuropsychological eval, like I said, by his neurologist, because they, they really wanted to rule out what could be some of the difficulties, what could be some of the differential diagnoses that they had. Um, I actually saw him, he was eating, uh, I had to go see him um, at, at, a, um, at a clinic, and he had brought in food and was repeatedly eating, uh, pulling out things out of his bag. Um, when we did the assessment, he had an impairment in working memory, recent memory. He was having difficulty with set shifting, disorganized, uh, disinhibited. He was having some difficulty with word retrieval. Um, now he had progressed a bit, I guess you would say, and I'm probably getting, giving you a little bit of an idea of what kind of, what kind of disorder he is, um, but he, um, uh, really was doing fine attentionally and processing speed wise. He was walking, his gait was fine, and he was denying any symptoms of anxiety or depression. Uh, so for him, uh, he actually was diagnosed with what's called a frontotemporal dementia behavioral variant based on the, his primary symptoms, which included uh, the orbitofrontal classic behaviors. Um, and he also was having just a progression of the disease so that it involved more of a cognitive symptoms involving now um, involvement of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex as well as some of his temporal regions. Um, so just due to time, I'm gonna to skip to the next one. This is Mr. M. He's a 58 year old man who had come in. Now he was really interesting. He was observed in the waiting room. He was hunched over and he was sad. Um, he had limited expression during discussions. Uh, he had um, adequate grooming, but was slow. Uh, slow to initiate, slow to move, somewhat lethargic. Now here on some testing, here's his processing speed measures. This is just a T-score. I'm sorry that they're not all Z-scores, um, but this is a T-score. Remember, high is good. This, I saw him actually twice. These aren't the real dates, um, but this is um, just put in automatically. But here's the average. Average is up here at 50. Here are his scores on trails A, the Stroop test, Stroop um, color test. And you can see that um, he's pretty, um, this is before and this was the second um, time I saw him, I guess, uh, a year later, yes. So here is, he's going a little bit up and down, but in general, you can see he's, he has a trend towards reducing in his inhibitory functions. All right, and just processing speed, just slightly. Here's his attention and working memory, digit span forwards, forward span, backward span, and letter number sequencing. Um, and you can see they're pretty, they're maintaining um, slightly lower over the year, but still within low average to average, although backward span and working memory certainly are um, uh, reduced at that time point, particularly for both, across both years. And here's in his inhibitory and problem solving. Same pattern. Now, when we get to his depression, anxiety, and apathy, you can see here, here's his anxiety. Higher is bad, all right? And his um, Beck depression inventory and um, geriatric depression scale really high across each of the time points that he's been followed. And you can see that here, uh, moderate to severe depression for him. So he was actually diagnosed with, um, he's just been maintained as intractable depression. And so his area would, that you would ex associate with frontal function would, would be more on the mesial, whereas the first case that I showed you would be more orbital frontal. All right. 
So overall today, this was just a brief discussion of the basic frontal regions of the, of the brain, how they connect subcortically, to remember that the frontal lobe is a mediator. Its, uh, its, its goal is to help us to regulate our internal drives with the environment and to help us produce and then act on the environment, all right? I also went over two basic clinical cases. Now, the one thing I really want you to do is just to keep reading, read on the frontal lobes. There are so many wonderful books out there on the frontal lobes. I just encourage you to do that. And like I said, just remember it's a mediator uh, for behavioral profiles. And I wanna thank you so much for letting me be here today. Thank you, Dr. Price. We really appreciate the talk that you gave us today. So informative. And I think something too is we've had so many Q and A's in today for our lecture. I would like to say there's so many on here. So we'll start off with some of the fun ones. You ended with case presentations, which I think is great in all of training. So for this one, they wanted to thank you for providing the case examples, but then when working with people with frontal lobe dysfunction and formal frontal disorders, do they realize something is wrong? For example, when drawing a clock, are they able to see the clock is drawn incorrectly? Oh, that's a great question. So um, sometimes, many times, individuals are not able to provide you with feedback that what they notice is any, that anything is wrong. Um, and so that's a really interesting observation. It's a really great question. In, in your clinical work, what do you do? Do you point it out to them that it, it is incorrect or do you ask them to compare? No, typically not. That's a great question. So you are taking that information in and you move on to the next task at that point. So for example, I'd say, well, do you see that this is, a, uh, can you tell me, do you think this is a, an accurate drawing of a clock? And you wait to see what they say. Then you would give a copy condition, see how they do on the copy. Or, or you move on to the next task to get more of data, to, to data gather. Exactly, I think it speaks to, not just do our tests give us so much information, but also behavioral observations that can be very yes. important for the feedback session. Yes, thank on. you, I agree. <laughs> so I think another question we have here is, can you speak more to the connections between the cerebellum and the frontal lobe? Oh, that's a great question. Oh my gosh, the cerebellum to the frontal lobe. So there's, the cerebellum has been so, underappreciated with regard to executive function um, and behavioral output. Um, so we have to remember processing speed elements are also involved with cerebellar. Um, we know that there are cerebellar regions involved in planning. Um, so, you know, you do have to think about that, but also from a neurotransmitter standpoint, um, you have to remember that the significant amount of dopamine um, impulse, and then also you have um, regions associated with acetylcholine production. So um, there's some wonderful work, uh, I'm sure as you know, um, being done on the cerebellum with regard to executive function. Um, it's just an area that you have to be aware of and you have to appreciate. Uh, I'm trying to think anybody else can chime in with regard to structures. It's just something you have to, you have to be aware of and read the literature and, and know that that is, it's a whole brain system. Understood. I think that's the whole point too of this lecture is trying to understand it's a whole brain system and it's hard to break it down sometimes. We really appreciate you trying to talk to us. I felt like for me personally, I felt like you were personally giving me a lecture today and I wanted to chime in some few times. But with this too, you speak to that it may be difficult to learn about all the different structures. What are some of the best resources that you give students to start learning all of this information? Ah. One of the best resources. Okay, so a reading resource, or a reading resource, or sure. Um, okay. Above Dr. Price. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, so one, of, some of the best resources. I would encourage you to read Kolb and Wishaw. Text is awesome. Uh, also, of course, the Lezak text. Uh, those are um, perfect. But I really always go back to Kolb and Wishaw. Those texts are. It, it's just perfect. And they have numerous iterations now. I'm not, I don't have the most recent version, but I encourage everyone. I, I always go back to the one that my first one, it's just fabulous. Yeah. I think it's great too, using those resources. We talked a little bit about feedback before. So some people had some feedback questions. With this, if somebody does have a frontal lobe disorder, how do you explain it to them in a feedback session? Oh, that's a great question. 
Well, um, very carefully. And I love feedback sessions. Typically, I, uh, what I do when I'm discussing things, I try to make it more simple. Um, for me, I do a lot of drawings. I like to make it, uh, I try to talk about the brain in a very simple way. So for example, one of my approaches is I talk about the brain as an apple. So I'll say, you know, how we have an apple. The apple is a, a you can visualize an apple and I'll talk to them about, okay, so the apple has an outside, you have your skin of the apple. And then you, uh, you know, if you cut the apple in half, then you have, you have the core and you also see the white and you have the seeds. And so the outside of the apple, the skin is just like the cortex. And then you have the, the core of the apple. If you can visualize cutting it in half, that is your, uh, those are your ventricles, right? So that's your, your, the core. Then you have the seeds, those are your subcortical nuclei. And then you have the white. So I'll actually we'll draw that out for them. And then we can have a discussion about what the white does. The white is, a, those are white matter fibers. And those are connecting the seeds to the skin and sending information back and forth. And then we talk about it and we draw. And then I talk about the different areas of the brain and the behaviors and kind of link it back to the drawing. So you have to be very concrete sometimes um, and uh, give information in a very kind, um, careful manner. And then, but make it so it has value and so that they understand how that impacts their life and link it back to what they're also indicating what their complaints are. So it has to be a give and take between you, the information that you have, as well as with the, um, the, the patient themselves or the, or the client. I think it's a great way of looking at it. It has to be very interactive. And it's very interactive, do that definitely. Patient quality of life. Yes. Provide something for them. And yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to steal the Apple description. Yeah, please so do. Drawing skills for that one. Definitely. We really appreciate your time, Dr. Price. We love the information that you gave us today. And I would like to do a shout out for next week as well. So next Monday, August 23rd, we will have Mary Pat McAndrews from University of Toronto presenting on learning and memory. So we look forward to everybody joining us next week. Thank you again, Dr. Price. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Stay well. Bye.